I just turned it off. Good evening, everyone. I'm Tom Putnam, the Edward W. Kane Executive Director here at the Concord Museum. Uh, I welcome all of you in the audience and those of you who are watching online to the second annual Robert Richardson Lecture, uh, which won't be a lecture, but a conversation between me and Dean. Uh, about two leaders of the Transcendentalist Movement, Ralph Waldo Emerson, whose birthday is today, and Theodore Parker. Uh, we're fortunate to have with us perhaps the nation's most eminent authority on Theodore Parker, uh, Dean Grodzins, um, whose biography, American Heretic, Theodore Parker in Transcendentalism, won the Alvin Nevins Prize from the Society of American Historians. Dean has served as a lecturer at Harvard, where he taught American history and literature, and as an associate professor of history at the Meadville Lombard Theological School. He's been a National Endowment for the Humanities Research Fellow at the Massachusetts Historical Society, a Pew Faculty Fellow at Yale University, and is senior researcher at Harvard Business School. He's also the former editor of the Journal of Unitarian Universalist History and the creator of the prize of a prize-winning comic strip. He is currently the senior researcher and case writer for the Case Method Institute for Education and Democracy, which promotes the use of case methods to improve how the history of American democracy is taught in US high schools. Bob Richardson called his book American Heretic, Theodore Parker and Transcendentalists, Transcendentalism, a tremendous achievement. Vivid, detailed, wide-ranging, it powerfully restores Theodore Parker to us as a major figure, one of the great activist intellectuals and an inspiration for his world and ours. It's fitting that we remember Bob, whose family moved to Concord when he was 15, and he would go on to write two highly regarded biographies of Emerson and Thoreau. In my first years as the director here at the museum, I spent countless hours enthralled with Bob's biographies, and a more slender but equally powerful volume entitled First We Read, Then We Write, Emerson on the Creator Process, in which Bob Richardson describes Emerson's notion of reading as a creative process. The student, Emerson writes, is to read history actively and not passively, to esteem his own life the text and books the commentary. I consider myself fortunate, like so many others, to have been an active reader of Bob Richardson's books and to be a student in the hands of a great and wise teacher. So I wrote to Bob and then I invited him to speak here in what he considered his hometown. It turned out to be his last public appearance before his untimely death. Uh, and uh, he spoke here in 2019 and died the following summer in 2020. Uh, the video of that talk is online, and I encourage you to view it at your leisure. It concludes with a lovely tribute to Bob by his brother Dave, who I know is watching tonight, along with other members of Bob's family. Uh, I was struck by the dedication of uh, Bob Richardson's Thoreau biography. Uh, he dedicated it to one of his professors at Harvard, W.J. Bate, who, Bob wrote, taught that in and through the personal rediscovery of the great we find that we need not be passive victims of what we deterministically call circumstances, that by linking ourselves with the great, we can become freer, freer to be ourselves, to be what we most want and value. Those are fitting words, I believe, to open a conversation about both Ralph Waldo Emerson and Theodore Parker, whose words and example inspire each of us to become freer, to be what we most value. So Dean, before we start talking about Theodore Parker's life, I wonder if you might put him in context for the audience in case some are less familiar with who he was mm -hmm. and why he is worthy <coughs> of our attention and study. Well, uh, he was one of the most important uh, uh, preachers and public intellectuals of the 19th century. He was a leading public intellectual of the anti-slavery movement. He uh, was a big figure in the Transcendentalist movement. So uh, if you look at, uh, at the, some of the big name Transcendentalists, today is, is Emerson's uh, 219th birthday. And so, uh, oh, can you, can you hear me? Uh, uh, but there's going to be a, 
a, uh, so Emerson was born in 1803. Thoreau, as you know here, was born 14 years later. Parker was born right in the middle, uh, seven years after uh, Emerson, uh, same year as, as Margaret Fuller, 1810. And he doesn't live very long. Also, I mean, Fuller dies young. Uh, Parker gets tuberculosis. He dies at the age of 49. But he, uh, he had a, a huge impact on his time and uh, what came afterwards. He's remembered as the archetype of the radical activist minister. And uh, we can talk about some of his enduring legacies. There's a story that I like uh, which shows his, his influence in Boston. He had the, uh, the largest congregation in Boston, even though his, his uh, uh, theology was very radical. So uh, people would want to know what he had to say when something happened. So there's a, a famous incident in 1856, you've probably heard of it, where a southern congressman canes Massachusetts Senator Charles Sumner on the floor of the Senate uh, because Sumner had given this, this uh, speech denouncing the, the pro-slavery effort to take over Kansas territory. And uh, so that was one of those events that shocked everybody. People remember where they were when they heard the news that that Sumner was caned. And uh, one account I read was of somebody who was a boy at the time. He was having tea with his mother and some of her friends. And his father walked into the room with such a serious expression on his face that all conversation stopped. And his mother asked, what's wrong? And he said, Sumner has been caned by a ruffian and lies near death. And there's shock silence. And uh, a couple of the women start to cry. And then one of them says, what a sermon Theodore Parker will preach on Sunday. <laughs> and that's, that was sort of, people wanted to know what he was going to say. Uh, they, they, he was an important figure uh, in Boston and nationally. So um, there are two quotes uh, of his that are familiar to us. I mean, slight um, differentiations, uh, but they're often attributed to Abraham Lincoln and Dr. Martin Luther King Jr. Tell us the two quotes and how they came to be associated, not with Theodore Parker, but with those two great orators. Uh, well, the the Two phrases of his that t people tend to remember are government, uh, they remember it this way, government of the people, by the people, for the people, and the arc of the moral universe is long, but it bends towards justice. So um, uh, both those quotations, by the way, when, when President Obama was in office, he had a rug in the Oval Office in which he had quotations that inspired him. He had uh, five quotations that inspired him. And both those were on there. So two out of five were Theodore Parker originated. I, I kind of like that. But the, um, the uh, Parker, the, the idea of, of government of the people, Parker started to talk in the 1840s about democracy. He started to have a lot to say about democracy. And he developed a moral definition of democracy, which was government of all the people, by all the people, for all the people. And he used versions of that definition many, many times in many speeches. So as I have figured it out, uh, I'm pretty sure Lincoln encountered it for the first time in 1854. Lincoln and Parker had a connection through Lincoln's uh, law partner, Billy Herndon. So 
for 14 years, Herndon and, and, and Lincoln were partners. They sat across a little desk in, in their office in Springfield. You can go visit it today. Um, Herndon was Lincoln's political sidekick. Uh, he later became Lincoln's biographer, one of his most important biographers. But he was also a huge admirer of Theodore Parker. And uh, he began buying Parker's books. My guess would be probably around 1850. Uh, and he began a correspondence with Parker in 1854, when Parker began a, uh, attacking the effort to spread slavery to all the Western territories in what was the Kansas-Nebraska Act, when Congress passed it and, and uh, lifted all bans on slavery in the Western territories. That act is what started Lincoln's political career again. He had been out of politics for a while. He decided to re-enter politics to fight that law. Um, and I wanted, there was, Parker gave some major sermons and speeches denouncing the law. And in w one of them, which uh, Herndon refers to in a letter, um, it contains that definition of democracy twice in two different places, uh, including in the very end, the big peroration. So I'm, pretty, I'm almost certain Lincoln saw it there first, but he could have seen it many other times later. And he, when he was during the Civil War, I mean, he, he doesn't talk that much about democracy for, for much of his career. But during the Civil War, he started to think, my impression is a lot more about it as he's coming to free the slave and starting to re, free the slaves and, and, uh, or, or help the slaves free themselves and come up with a, a new way of imagining America. So he starts, he, he, he then, in the Gettysburg Address, he he sort of imagines this moral democracy, but then that Parker uses, but rather than talking about of all the people, by all the people, he uses the language of the Constitution, of all, by all, you know, or just, just of the, just the, you know, we the people. So he, he takes Parker's idea of this ideal form of government and he grounds it in, in the Constitution. So that's how, that's how Lincoln gets it. Now, the, the, Martin Luther King's story. So Parker um, published a book in 1852 called uh, Ten Sermons of Religion, which he dedicated to Emerson, by the way. And uh, in that sermon, he, he, uh, he makes, in, in a, one of the sermons that he publishes, he says, um, uh, the arc of the universe is long. I, I, I cannot see it by reason, but I know that it bends towards justice. Uh, and many years later, now you go about 100 years later, uh, the Montgomery bus boycott is going on in uh, Montgomery, Alabama, being led by the young Dr. Martin Luther King Jr. Uh, and as the, it had been a long, hard fight, it had been going on for a year, uh, and a magazine dedicated to the civil rights movement called Liberation was published, dedicated, marking the first anniversary of the bus boycott. They spent the whole, the whole issue on the bus boycott. And one thing they did is they asked all these distinguished people to come and, and contribute, like Eleanor Roosevelt and so forth. And one of them was a guy named John Haynes Holmes, whose grandfather had been in Theodore Parker's church and who winds up becoming a major figure in his own right. He was a minister in New York in the 20th century. He helped found the NAACP. He helped found the ACLU. He was a friend of Mahatma Gandhi's and, and, and visited Gandhi many times. Anyway, he writes, he writes a tribute in there to the, uh, uh, to the boycotters, and he says, as Theodore Parker told a doubting world a century ago, the arc of the moral universe is long, but it bends towards justice. So King reads that, and almost the next day, a decision comes down from the Supreme Court saying that the boycotters had won. And so... Uh, King gives a press conference. 
And in that press conference, he uses that, that line, which had stuck in his mind. The arc of the moral universe is long, but it bends towards justice. And he then, he liked it because it, it expressed the struggle and the hope uh, uh, of the struggle, no matter how difficult it got. And uh, so he used it many, many times thereafter, probably most famously uh, uh, on the, the march to Montgomery, the Selma to Montgomery march at the big speech he gives on the, uh, on the State House steps there. So you can see how these ideas about, about a moral vision of democracy, about um, a, sort of a, a, a belief in the moral order of the universe that will that will lead to the triumph of justice. Both these ideas were uh, Parker's ideas. So let's uh, jump to the <clears throat> relationship between Emerson and Parker. You talked about there being seven years difference. Uh, in your book, you note that Parker attended both of Emerson's famous addresses at mm -hmm. Harvard, the American Scholar Address and the Divinity School Address. Mm -hmm, mm -hmm. Were they friends? Were they foes? Were they rivals? <laughs> Um, uh, they were temperamentally rather different, but uh, Parker enormously admired Emerson. Um, Emerson uh, had a more complicated relationship with Parker. He didn't quite know what to do with him for much of early on, uh, but they worked together on many projects. So um, I believe there was actually a possibility, and this is a, this is, not as well known a story, but Parker had come out to visit Concord um, in uh, 1835. He had come out to give a lecture on meteorology, of all things, and, uh, and Emerson had him over for dinner. And so they, they met and talked. And then the next year, uh, Parker uh, is starting his ministerial career. And so when you're launching out of divinity school, you get to candidate at different pulpits. So you go from pulpit to pulpit to pulpit. And he came here to Concord and candidated to be the minister here in Concord. And he wanted to be here because Emerson was here. But he didn't get the job. Instead, it went to Barzillai Frost, who you know, if you know the Emerson story, Emerson got so exasperated with Barzillai Frost's pedestrian preaching that he winds up uh, that was part of the inspiration for the Divinity School Address in which he says he, he's urging these young ministers to, to preach their soul because he's, he, he says that the, the, the preacher is talking and there's a snowstorm out the window, but the snowstorm is real and the preacher is spectral. And he's referring there to Barzillai Frost. Um, so Parker didn't get that job. He wound up getting a job in a little pulpit in West Roxbury. Uh, which was his first career, a uh, first position, uh, until he became famous, and then he was invited to come to Boston. But they worked together on the dial. Uh, Parker would contribute, which was the big uh, transcendentalist, first big transcendentalist journal, um, which was edited by Margaret Fuller, and uh, then by Emerson. And Parker would contribute articles on uh, theology and religious controversies, and Emerson later remembered that those issues would always sell out hmm. because uh, Parker was already developing a reputation as, a, as such a forceful figure and, and willing to engage controversial ideas. And then in 1841, uh, Parker gives a sermon called On the Transient and Permanent in Christianity in, in Boston, uh, at an ordination in Boston, and it inaugurates a controversy that lasts for years. Because he essentially says, we don't, in order to be good Christians, we do not have to believe in the miraculous authority of the Bible. We do not have to believe in the miraculous authority of Jesus. These are incidental to the meaning, true meaning of Christianity. Well, that was a pretty controversial idea, right? And the unit, he was a Unitarian, so Parker was a Unitarian, like Emerson had grown up a Unitarian, like Thoreau had grown up a Unitarian. Uh, but Parker was a Unitarian minister, and the Unitarians at that time said, whoa, this is too, too radical for us. And they did their best to kind of shut him out, and he was, um, uh, he was uh, banned in a lot of ways. But there's a story that when Emerson was giving a lecture in Boston in 1842, 
Parker showed up because Parker showed up at all Emerson's lectures. He admired Emerson, and they uh, uh, he Par Emerson stepped off the stage to say hello to Parker at the at this meeting to show that he was sort of in the midst of all this that he he uh, you know he he stood with Parker. Um, Later on, Parker started his own journal. He tried to get Emerson to be editor. Emerson did not want to be editor, but so they had a bit of a dispute about that. You know, Emerson and Parker announced that Emerson was the editor, and Emerson said, "No, well, really, I'm not." <laughs> um, but where where things really shifted was when uh, in 1850, as part of the the Compromise of 1850, Congress passes a fugitive slave law, which. Um, creates the first, essentially creates a federal fugitive slave catching bureaucracy. Up to this time, if a fugitive got to the north, it was largely up to state officials to, to uh, and the, the slave owner or, or uh, enslaver him or herself to, to take care of it and try to get the person. But now they create a federal bureaucracy to do this. And it was an enormously controversial law and uh, in the North and here in Massachusetts. And Parker starts leading the fight against that law. Um, uh, or he at least leads it in the white community. The black community is already organized on this. They've been doing this for years. But Parker then uh, builds this, the Vigilance Committee of Boston, which is, which is a black-white alliance. Um, and uh, Parker very much admires, I mean, Emerson very much admires what Parker is doing. Um, and uh, I was, I've mentioned a story uh, to Tom. I, uh, Bob Richardson was a friend of mine, and uh, for the 200th anniversary, Emerson's 200th birthday, they, uh, we, we all came out here to Concord. They had a bus from, from uh, the from the Massachusetts Historical Society, where, where the conference was taking place, out here. And we came out, and we were allowed to go to the, old, to the old manse and roam around, and there were some books on the shelves that we could take off. But look, and one of them was a book by Theodore Parker. Mm -hmm. uh, which, and it was about his... You know, Parker was arrested for his role in rescuing a fugitive slave in 1854, Anthony Burns, and, or trying to rescue a fugitive slave. It didn't happen. And uh, he, was, he was indicted and, and put on trial in federal court. And he wrote an account of it. And he sends this book to Emerson, uh, inscribed to Emerson. Um, and later, Parker gets very ill with tuberculosis. He has to leave the country. But his church is still there. They're still meeting in Boston. They would rent a theater, what's now the Orpheum Theater. They would rent that. And... Uh, uh, they needed people to fill the pulpit. And uh, so Emerson was one of those people. He came back. He hadn't preached in many years, but he, he came back to fill this, this pulpit on Sunday uh, in 1859. Mm. Um, and one of the other people, interestingly enough, who was going to, to fill the pulpit was Frederick Douglass. But then right about the time Frederick Douglass was going to fill the pulpit, uh, John Brown makes his big attack on Harper's Ferry, and Douglas knows that it's very dangerous for him to be around because people knew that he knew John Brown. So uh, he has to leave. He has to leave. Mm -hmm. So now there's a vacancy. So who do they bring in? They bring in Thoreau. Mm. So Thoreau had just given his his speech in defense of John Brown. He gives it again. Oh in Parker's pulpit in Boston. So, um, and then when, uh, when Parker died, Emerson gave a, a tribute at the, at the big event in, in Boston uh, to, to Parker. So. You write um, that uh, <clears throat> for Emerson, when people view transcendentalism uh, through Emerson's eye, it's a movement away from religion. Mm -hmm. Whereas if the story of transcendentalism is told from Parker's point of view, it looks quite different, quote, he never abandoned the ministry and theology remained a central concern for him even when he grew more political. So talk just a little bit about his commitment to the church and to his ministry. Well, he was, he was always very, uh, he was a reformer. He saw himself as a religious reformer. 
uh, and so, uh, and he loved the ministry. Emerson had been a minister but didn't particularly like it. Uh, and uh, uh, eventually you know, left it. I mean, it, it, his father and grandfather had been ministers, but then he, he didn't particularly like it and he left. Uh, Parker, who came from a farming family and, and uh, was the first member of his family to go to college, loved the ministry. Um, and uh, he, but he came to believe that uh, theology was deeply flawed because it, it m m this traditional theology uh, didn't recognize human divine potential uh, and didn't really recognize, he believed, the absolute perfection of God. So we had concepts like hell. And he said, how can you have a, a perfectly just God and there be a hell? How can you have, uh, how can we recognize human potential uh, and the divine in us if we say our, we have to believe everything that's in the Bible because that has authority over us? Uh, so he made it his mission to change theology. And in the process, reform the church. So... Uh, when he moved to Boston, and what happened was he had a lot of friends and admirers in Boston, and uh, they decided um, that he, he couldn't stay in West Roxbury, this little church in West Roxbury, because he was too isolated there. He deserved a bigger audience, so they organized a, a church for him in Boston. Um, so... Uh, when he moved there, he, he wanted to experiment with new ways of doing things. Uh, so it is, was the custom, the tradition in, in uh, New England churches at that time that you had two services. You went to two services. You went to one in the morning and one in the afternoon. Um, and Parker thought this was a terrible waste of time. There were much better things for you to do that would be more religiously and morally fulfilling on your one day off, because it was usually one day off at that time. There was no such thing as a weekend at that time. Uh, that on a Sunday afternoon, then to go to another church service. So he got rid of it. Uh, he had a reception at his house in which he invited lots of people to come, and they could have conversation, and they could do other things, but there was no, there was no service. He also gave up communion, because he thought, um, like Emerson, he didn't really see the point of that. He largely, he stopped doing baptisms very much because he thought that, you know, there was a lot of superstition around it. Um, so he, if, if, the, if a parent requested it, he would do it. Uh, but he, he generally avoided it after he moved to Boston. And uh, the one, but he, he believed very strongly in weddings and funerals and he did those all the time. Um, so, uh, and he experimented with the texts that were read at, at, in the church, and uh, he experimented with different forms of, uh, of, of worship. So he tried all kinds of things. And he had, a, he had an impact, although all through his career, uh, he was considered an outsider, uh, religious outsider. After his death, the rising generation of, of Unitarians came to regard him as a hero of the free pulpit. Mm. And so a lot of people began to model his ideas and so forth in, in, uh, by the late 19th century. Um, just to synopsize, you write that he was passionately religious, believed deeply in the existence of God and the immortality of the soul without being theologically conservative. Mm -hmm. um, but uh, when, you, when I read your book, I mean, he casts himself often as a prophet and a martyr, and mm -hmm. there's a little bit of sense, and many were moved by his preaching, especially mm -hmm. those in the mm -hmm. Roxbury and then clearly later in the Boston mm -hmm. congregation. But others are turned off by his arrogance and hubris. So, you know, he's not all, I mean, there, there's a, not a dark side, but there's a, a difficult parts of his personality. Yeah. Uh, well, I mean, he... Parker had a, um, uh, my reading of Parker is that he originally thought that he was going to have a great establishment career in Unitarianism. And he was going to join 
sort of the Boston elite. I think when he was a young man, he was very ambitious. This is kind of what he wanted. He sort of thought maybe he might become dean of the Harvard Divinity School. Um, he marries a woman who is a uh, um, uh, member of the Cabot family, you know, yeah. And so uh, the, you know, as, as, the, as the old saying goes, the Lowell's talk to the Cabots and the Cabots talk only to God. Um, so uh, he, but then things did not work out. And the elite wind up rejecting him. It's both personal and it's uh, ideological. Um, and he hates them right back. <laughs> and I, one of the reasons I think he develops his definition of democracy as government of all, by all, for all, is because he's come to the belief that the elite of Boston is trying to govern Boston for its own interests. It's not interested in, in all the people. And he wants to come up with a more democratic vision. Um, uh, at the same time, in a very personal way, he, you know, he, this idea that he was widely criticized for his theology, uh, that he, you know, people attacked him for his politics, um, it, it, uh, he came to see himself as having suffered um, the, for um, the, the, the uh, contumny of, of, of the unrighteous. Um, and, uh, and it turned out that that aspect of his career really resonated with a lot of people who, uh, who also agreed with him that, yes, this was a sign, his, the attacks on him were a sign that he was a righteous person. And my favorite example of this, if you go to the Boston Public Library, to the Rare Book Room, which is currently closed, but it, it's presumably going to reopen soon, um, some women who were in his congregation left behind scrapbooks. And they would make clippings in these scrapbooks of all these things about Theodore Parker. Uh, and I was talking about these scrapbooks with another scholar who works in British history. And he said to me, oh yes, that was a common devotional practice among women in churches. They would make volumes, scrapbooks about their minister. And isn't it interesting that they never put in anything negative about their minister, always positive stuff. And I blinked and I said, that's not what was happening at all. Here in these beautiful books, carefully, you know, with like tissue paper between the pages and Elliot, were these articles denouncing Parker, <laughs> telling, saying that he was a, a you know, a, a, an infidel and he was, uh, he was destroying Christianity and he was undermining the Republic. And, but they were lovingly preserved. <laughs> Why? Because this was a sign that he was a righteous person. This was a sign he was a true prophet. And I've found examples of people who enact that in their own lives, uh, who were become part, who become admirers of Parker, where they 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 see this opposite, they provoke opposition, and that it they come back, to, and they see this as a sign that they that they are on a righteous path. And I think that the that Parkerism as a movement. That's sort of the emotional kick to it. It's beyond any particulars of his theology. Uh, the, 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 it, it had a, that tone to it. That meant, though, that he was always oppositional. Uh, there, uh, there's an oppositional quality to him. And, um, and people never forgot it. I, there's, a, there's a book that was published in 1900. So this is 40 years after Parker's death. By um, the guy who... Uh, 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 Barrett Wendell, who was a professor at Harvard and who uh, uh, helped found the history and literature concentration at Harvard, the oldest concentration at Harvard. So he writes a history of American literature and he has a thing on Parker in it. And he says, you know, the vituperation that he used against, uh, on the issue of slavery uh, is a, a sign that a self-made man cannot quite overcome the limitations of his origins and appreciate his social betters. 
this is 1900. Right? It was not forgotten. Um, and uh, so uh, the, I, I uh, but I do think that it, it plays a role in, in, the, in the fights in Boston leading up to the Civil War that you had a lot of people who are sort of primed for opposition. Mm -hmm. So, To cast him in a more sympathetic light and you really feel for him in your biography uh, in the first years of his marriage, just mm -hmm. talk about that complicated time. Right. So he marries um, Lydia Dodge Cabot, who's... Um, uh, a, a, her family is a uh, not one of the major Cabot lines, but she's she has a a uh, a great uncle who is George Cabot, the the famous Federalist who chaired the the uh, Hartford Convention. Um, and uh, he the uh, attention very quickly develops in their marriage after they get married uh, after they they be settle in together in Roxbury. He initially didn't really want to settle in Roxbury um, because it was too small and they really couldn't pay him very much. Um, but his wife was taking care of her invalid aunt, who's a very, um, uh, a very strong personality, uh, Lucy Cabot, and uh, she was also very wealthy. She never married. Uh, and she had these chronic health issues, and so uh, her niece was taking care of her. And so uh, Lucy comes with the marriage. So when uh, when they so Lucy says, "I want you to settle in West Roxbury." I think it was convenient for her that he settles in West Roxbury. And don't worry about the salary; I'll pay for things. I'll buy the house. I'll do this. I'll, Parker hated that. And so there's this tension that develops between the two of them. And it gets accelerated because they disagree on politics. They disagree on theology. And uh, Lydia is caught in the middle of it. And uh, part, she feels more attached times to her aunt than to her husband. And Parker gets very angry and alienated. And it, it's... It's, they, they have a lot of difficulty in their early marriage as a result of this. My, one of my discoveries, it's in the book, but uh, Parker knew a lot of languages. Uh, he was famous for that. By the time he graduated from uh, Harvard, he claimed he could read 20 languages. And he learned more later. So, uh, so his journals are often break out into German and French and Latin and Greek. So I'm reading through the journals, and um, I don't really know Latin or Greek, but I mean, I, you know, I'm, these are mostly quotations. And, you know, so, but I, re, I look at a passage, and it's in Greek. It's Greek characters. But I look at it, and I say, that doesn't look like Greek. That looks like English. And I realize what he had done is he'd written something in English, but then coded it by using Greek letters. So I decoded it. Uh, and one of the things he says is, my wife is a devil, I have no hope in life. Uh, now there are many particular things that happened right around there, but it was, very, it was a very difficult time for him personally, and I think a lot of things you know, uh, there's another element of his life, which was that he grew up in a large family, but almost all of them died by the time he, he was in his mid-20s. And uh, lots of brothers and sisters had died, and uh, somewhat like, like, you know, Emerson had a similar experience with two, you know, uh, mm -hmm. his, his two brothers. Um, but Parker had more brothers and sisters, and they died. And it had a big effect on him, and it affected his, what he, his hopes for his family. And when these weren't realized, this, uh, this hurt him. And it was also, I should say, hard for Lydia, too. It's harder to get her side of the story, but I've been trying to mm -hmm. figure that out. Uh, and I think it affected him when all this theological controversy came down on him in 1841. It was right at the time that his marriage was going through its worst period, and it, it, it was very emotionally uh, difficult. Uh, 
So what began to change, a couple of things happened, uh, uh, but one was that uh, uh, Parker was so worn out by the theological controversy, he publishes mountains of stuff in between 1841 and 1843, like, oh, thousands of pages, and he's worn out. And he goes, so he goes to Europe, uh, and Lydia goes with him. Um, and it's the first time they've actually been able to spend lots of time together without Lucy around. Uh, and they, they kind of reconcile. They realize they, they like one another. Uh, he gives his wife a nickname during that trip. The first time, they've been married seven years by that point, the first time he gives her a nickname, which is, which is Bear. They, she was fascinated by the bears of Bern in Switzerland and calls, starts calling her Bear. And I could go in on about that, but they, there were, uh, they became more allied and uh, they never had children, which was a burden, for, which was hard on both of them. Um, but then they moved to Boston, and Lucy didn't come with them. So uh, instead, uh, they left a nurse behind, uh, who was a very accomplished woman named Hannah Stevenson, who took care of Lucy until she died. And then, then as it happened, Lucy died of an illness that also made Lydia rather ill. They, the cholera went around, and and so. Hannah Stevenson moves in with them in Boston to take care of Lydia initially, and she winds up staying for the next 10 years. Uh, and her influence on the household is completely the opposite of Lucy's. Uh, Lydia loves her, Parker loves her, uh, and she winds up filling a role. This is, this is maybe a little beyond what you were asking, but um, Lydia Parker was a very shy, retiring woman. And she didn't, she really didn't like to have a public role at all. And now Parker was minister of the largest congregation in Boston. And the minister's wife had a lot to do, mm -hmm. right? And she didn't really want to do it. So along comes Hannah Stevenson, who's a very well-educated and forceful personality. And uh, she's willing to take on a lot of these sort of public roles, you know, to serve on these committees, do this, do that. So. If, since you have some things here by Louisa May Alcott. So Louisa May Alcott, when she's a young woman, she goes to Boston, uh, and she starts attending Theodore Parker's church. She writes about it in her novel, Work. And at one point, she's trying to figure out what she wants to do for a career. And who does she go talk to? She goes talk to Hannah Stevenson. And later on, after Parker's death, uh, the Civil War begins. Hannah Stevenson becomes the first woman from Massachusetts to volunteer to be a nurse down on the front. And then when uh, Louisa May Alcott decides she wants to be a nurse, she goes and asks Hannah Stevenson for help. Hannah Stevenson brings her down. And so Louisa May Alcott's first book, Hospital Sketches, uh, which is based on her experiences in the war, um, is dedicated to Hannah Stevenson. So, but anyway, so Hannah Stevenson, I could tell a lot more about her, but, but the idea was that their, their marriage shifted and became much closer uh, later on. So let's shift now again. You know, you've referenced it already, but some of his politics. Mm -hmm. um, and I thought one way of starting that, let me just read a few lines from a recent book by John Behrens called Conflagration. Right. Uh, uh, and these are more her, his words than mine, but... Um, First, he suggests that while Parker is fighting battles over the heart and the soul of the church, Emerson moves in a more literary direction. Uh, he argues the center of transcendentalism was not in Concord with its focus on individualism, but Boston, where you had mostly church people who wanted a moral and spiritual revival in community and saw the church as a critical for showing the way, and he uses Parker as an example. Mm -hmm. uh, from what I understand, Parker did not believe in moral suasion or Christian's non-resistance, no. the pacifist stance taken by William Lord Garrison and others, but he felt like his grandfather, who we haven't referenced, but John Parker of right. the Lexington Battle. Captain Parker of the right. Battle of Lexington, yeah. Uh, that you might need armed resistance to protect life, liberty, and the pursuit of happiness. Just one last quote. In keeping with his transcendentalist faith, 
Parker was certain of a higher law, a law made by the universal and transcendent God to which he was accountable, even if it meant breaking the fallible statutes passed by mere men here on earth. So right. talk about Parker's politics and whether those represented well in those quotes I just gave. Well, I mean, Parker, um, to understand, Parker had an interesting position in the anti-slavery movement. So the anti-slavery movement is uh, very divided by the 1840s between people who are um, uh, interested in political action and the moral suasionists, like, like Garrison. So the moral suasionists are saying, we can't participate in politics because the Constitution recognizes slavery. We can't, therefore, recognize the legitimacy of the Constitution. We won't vote. Uh, we won't campaign. Um, we will uh, uh, instead fight slavery in other ways. Um, Thoreau gives up voting. Um, but uh, then there are the political abolitionists who are trying to organize political parties, the Liberty Party, the Free Soil Party, later the Republican Party, which are dedicated to uh, being in some sense anti-slavery, but much more moderately because they all have to take into account the Constitution and how much the sort of the presumed guarantees given to slavery in the Constitution. Um, and so they, they, they usually don't talk about abolishing slavery in the South, but you know, limiting it in the West and leading it to ultimate extinction. So there's this growing kind of split and argument Parker was one of the people who could talk to everybody, and everybody respected him. And he was able to say, well, he, he had a vision that it could all work. Everything was needed. You needed all types of activism. Um, and so he played this kind of bridging role uh, b between these different factions in the movement. And he was very active in, in anti-slavery politics in Massachusetts. But he was very active. There was a, the Free Soil Party, which was a big anti-slavery party that had a big role in Massachusetts politics from the late 1840s to the early 1850s. He was very involved in that, kind of behind the scenes. Um, uh, he did, uh, uh, he was, often gave testimony to the state legislators, uh, le legislature. He was very involved in things like that. And it, but his approach was very different than, say, Thoreau's, or, because they had very different visions of civil disobedience. If you, if you read Thoreau's account of civil disobedience, it's very individual focused. And he's saying, how can I deal with uh, an unrighteous time? How can I refuse to accept and, and, and acknowledge this unrighteous era? Parker is interested in mobilizing people to resist the law. And uh, so he, he organizes large movements of people to try to get them to uh, rescue fugitive slaves. Um, he's a great advocate of saying that jurors should never, if you're, if you're anti-slavery and you get on a jury and you have, and somebody's brought up for you or in front of you for rescue and fugitive slave, don't pay attention to what the lawyers say. Listen to the higher law. Vote, them, vote not to convict them. That's called jury nullification. <laughs> but he, he strongly advocated for it. And I think to understand that, you know, I, I've sometimes thought about it this way. Um, today, we often think about human rights and rule of law as compatible concepts, and they kind of lean on one another. They each has a history, and you could get into that, but that's how we often think of it today. Um, but what happens when they don't, when they're uh, in opposition, as they were in the issue of slavery, because the Constitution recognized slavery the federal laws recognize slavery. What do you do if you believe in human rights? And so what you find is that uh, people made choices. And some people chose rule of law and became defenders of, of uh, 
uh, the fugitive slave law and so forth, and uh, some chose human rights. And uh, Parker was definitely the latter. So, um, Without getting too deep into the details, what, what you referenced uh, John Brown earlier mm -hmm. more with Frederick Douglass not filling the pulpit, but what was Theodore Parker's relationship to John Brown and the raid at Harper's Ferry? Um, so a group of supporters in... Uh, when when, when uh, Parker first got to know John Brown, when John Brown was fighting in Kansas to, to help uh, make it a free state. And uh, Parker was involved in, with some of the committees that gave money to the free state settlers. And so John Brown came to his house at, at that time. Um, then John Brown began developing his idea of starting a slave insurrection in Virginia. And he, he talked about it in different ways to different groups of people. But uh, he needed money, and he needed weapons. And he needed to get those. He talked to a group of, of uh, supporters who had some money. Some were quite rich. Some were moderately rich, like Parker. Some were, you know, had, had, had some money. And they formed a, a, they formed a secret committee that is, was later known as the Secret Committee of Six. And Parker was a, the dominant figure in, in that committee of at least of the, there are five of them were in Boston, one was in New York. Of the Boston crowd, uh, Parker was the dominant figure. Um, and so he gave John Brown a lot of money and uh, helped him buy weapons. But then, uh, John Brown was forced to postpone his attack. He was originally going to make it in, in uh, 1858, but then his plans almost got revealed. So he had to. So Parker took the position that he had to postpone it, and it was postponed. Then Parker has to. Uh, Parker gets sick, uh, or sicker. He can't. He can't. He, he, so he leaves the country for his health, and while he's out of the country. That's when the, the raid on Harper's Ferry happens. And Parker then proceeds to write a public letter defending John Brown. And he writes privately to a friend, no one will ever know where old John Brown got his money. <laughs> but we now do know where he got his money. So. Um, I'd like to take questions from the audience just a moment. But why don't you finish out his life of where he died and how his life came to an end? Yes. Well, he, got, he, he, he uh, developed tuberculosis like Thoreau and many others. And um, he continued to work and preach for a couple of years after that began to develop. Um, but it, his health was getting worse and worse. And finally, he, uh, he suffers a physical collapse in early 1859. And he uh, uh, leaves. He, he's decided that he has to go to someplace warmer so he launches on a voyage, and he first goes to the Caribbean, where he writes a, a sort of autobiographical uh, letter called Theater, that's now called Theodore Parker's Experience as a Minister, which is, uh, if you want an autobiography, that's the closest he came he, he, to writing one. Uh, then he traveled to Europe. He eventually uh, died in Florence, Italy. And that's where he is buried. So if you want to visit Theodore Parker's grave, you go to the Protestant Cemetery in Florence. He's just... What was that weekend? Yes. <laughs> it's just down, the, just down the, the way from Elizabeth Barrett Browning, who's also buried, huh. buried there. So um, there's actually a weird story. I'll tell you this, because it's a very weird story. So when Parker died... Um, his doctor and a good friend of his who was a scientist decided that um, they would do uh, some, a medical study and they removed his brain. Mm -hmm. And they were convinced that his body would eventually be relocated to Boston. Right? He should be buried in Boston. So they, they prepared the body to be shipped. They, they put it in a lead casket filled with spirits and and that's presumably how he's still buried there. Because Lydia said, no, he wants to be buried where he died. So he never moved. But before that was settled, the brain was shipped to Boston. Mm. And who was it shipped to? Well, it wound up going into the house of Samuel Gridley and Julia Ward Howe, 
Now, uh, Samuel Gridley and Julie Ward Howe had known Parker for many, many years. He baptized their first child and, uh, in the 1840s, and um, they had actually gone with him on the first leg of his voyage in 1859. So they last see him in the Caribbean, and then suddenly this sailor shows up with Parker's brain in a box. Well, they're kind of horrified. They don't know what to do. Now, Samuel Gridley Howe, you may know, was director of the Perkins School for the Blind, and so they lived there. So they put it in a closet in the up, upstairs of the Perkins School for the Blind. And their daughter, who, who became a well-known writer in her own right, the, the first woman to win a Pilcher, she won the first Pilcher Prize in biography, actually. But she wrote, wrote in her memoir that she was terrified of that closet. Mm. Now, what happened to the brain after that, I don't know exactly, but I have a theory, which is that Samuel Gridley Howe decided to have it buried with him. Hmm. So I think it's in Mount Auburn Cemetery, buried with, hmm. which is also where Lydia is buried, by the way. She's buried in Mount Auburn Cemetery. So I think it's there, and, uh, but the only way I could find out is to dig him up, and I'm not, I don't <laughs> feel like I can do that. <laughs> We're coming to the end of our hour, but does anyone here have questions? Seeing, oh, yeah, there's somebody back. Right? Uh, two. For the people. Hi, Dean. Uh, so maybe you could talk a little bit more about how Parker was such a thorn in the side of the, of the Unitarian hierarchy and what exactly it was that they, I mean, obviously the theology, but also the anti-slavery, that was kind of like the, the double death blow for them, wasn't it? Um, the... Unitarians, uh, I mean, Parker was, when Parker came along, when the Transcendentalists came along, most Unitarians, I mean, they'd abandoned the Trinity, hence their name. Um, they were, uh, they'd abandoned the idea of original sin because they didn't think it was in the Bible. But most of them still believed that the Bible had some sort of authority, or at least parts of it did. Um, and along comes Emerson and Thoreau, and Emerson and Parker, and they say, no, that's not true. And in fact, the Bible, Parker is, uh, you know, the, 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 talks about the Bible being full of myths. Okay. And so a lot of, uh, but now the Unitarians had a problem. A lot of them very strongly disagree with him, but they had made, when they themselves had broken from the Calvinists, so the Unitarians had broken from the Calvinists, uh, between 1805 and 1815. And when they did that, they, they said, we're not like them because we believe in, in freedom of belief. We're not going to have a creed. We, 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 we have freedom of conscience for, for Unitarians. But wait a minute, this guy is saying something we really disagree with. So how can we draw a line? And it caused all kinds of problems. They kept trying to draw a line, but they had a hard, they really couldn't do it. They weren't structurally able to do it. And uh, so they just tried to freeze him out. That was the best they could do, was sort of freeze him out. They weren't going to invite him to pulpits. They, he would show up. He made a point of showing up at association meetings. Uh, and they didn't like it, but they didn't have any way to throw him out. Um, and then the other problem was is that uh, Unitarianism was the religion of the establishment of Boston, pretty much. I mean, you find some Episcopalians in there and some Congregationalists, but basically in the early 19th century it was, it was Unitarian. And those people, many of them were, were uh, uh, merchants and many of them were invested in, in business in the South and they were, they, they were, they, they were anti-abolitionist. And here comes Parker, this ardent abolitionist, and it created a lot of tension. And uh, oh, there was a, the, one of the most famous elements was that William Ellery Channing, who was the leading uh, Unitarian, his successor at um, uh, the, uh, was at his church was uh, Ezra Stiles Gannett, uh, who was very politically conservative. And uh, when the fugitive slave law controversy happened, 
um, one of the ways they created a, a, a bureaucracy is they created this, this network of court commissioners who were called fugitive slave, the abolitionists called them fugitive slave commissioners because they could arrest a fugitive slave. And one of the leading fugitive, one of the most active fugitive slave commissioners in Boston was in Gannett's church. Mm. Parker had fugitive slaves in his church. Mm. So uh, Parker said, you know, doctor, members of Dr. Gannett's church were trying to kidnap members of mine. Mm. And uh, that's the division of Unitarianism right there. Mm. Uh, and it, it, uh, uh, it winds up, it winds up, uh, um, you know, it, it, it it only, I say, it, 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 the, you start to get a reconciliation after his death, but only after his death. Wait, one more question. Uh, okay. I think it was you. you yeah. 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 I just want to say I am a Unitarian minister from oh. Grafton. <laughs> um, so I'm really excited to be here. Uh, question. Um, was Parker a part of any fraternal organizations? I, and the reason why I, I asked is because there's so much about his theology that just sound, it sounds almost like Freemasonry to me. So I'm just curious to know if there's a connection there. Um, I know, as far as I know, he never joined the, the Masons. Uh, I mean, a lot of um, uh, Unitarians were involved in the Masons. Bob Gross writes about the Masons in, in, in Concord in his, in his book and their influence and both the both their early influence and then along comes the anti-masonic party and and uh um so uh he did join uh various learned societies um uh scientific and uh, biblical you know and, and and historical but he he was not a member of any such organization and i think he he sort of came to the belief that they really wouldn't have wanted him uh, because uh, he was a little too uh, controversial. So, um, yeah. The old Woody Allen line that he wouldn't ever want to join a group that would have yeah, him as a member. Yeah, I can't remember that. Was, was that him or Groucho Marx? Yeah, yeah one that, of those guys. That Groucho Marx, I yeah. think you're right. Um, so. uh, I thought I would just end with uh, these words. Um, a story about Parker's grave uh, in Florence, Italy, where we just learned his brainless body is now buried. Uh, but at the time, his wife Lydia chose a very simple marker for his grave. Um, and then some 27 years later, Frederick Douglass visited, and he wrote to one of his friends, quote, I'm not an advocate of costly monuments over the decaying bodies of the dead, but the stone at such a man's grave should be a sermon. And so he, Frederick Douglass, paid for a new gravestone. Well, it was it was actually a big movement. A group, couple oh, nice. people. One, one uh, Elizabeth Cady Stanton's son uh, was began part or, was part of that movement. He began organizing Parker's friends in Europe and in America to raise money for a new stone, mm -hmm. which is they then uh, hired uh, the the sculptor Joseph Story, who was uh, who had actually sculpted Parker in his last year, and a story then made this new tombstone, which some people think has in it the first, for, for you, you, you people, uh, has the first depiction of a flaming chalice on it associated ah. with you. It's on the top of it. And do you know the words? I wrote them down. Oh, go ahead. <laughs> um, uh, and so the words, uh, it uh, calls Theodore Parker the great American preacher. It gives the dates and places of his birth and death, and then adds these words. His name is engraved in marble, his virtues in the hearts of those he helped to free from slavery and superstition. <laughs> we will end there on the story of Theodore Parker, and thank you. Thank you very much. Thank you. thank you also very much for coming. Those of you online, thank you for watching. That was great. Oh, good. Thank you. Good. <coughs> oh, thank you. Oh, good. Hey.
<laughs> I didn't know the brain story. <laughs> oh, you didn't?